Good evening. It's good to see everyone here tonight. Thank you so much for being here. Let's be in prayer for tonight's service. And don't, don't forget about this week. Uh, come back. We should be starting at 7 during the week. Uh, but please uh, return and come back this week. And, and let's get into the Word together and see what the Lord has for us. And uh, We had a wonderful message this morning. Brother Vitatel is wonderful. And um, something we have to keep in mind throughout this whole week and just our whole lives. Uh, is there sin that's keeping us from the Lord? Is there sin that's bottled down inside that we need to, to get rid of? Um, and we need to take care of that today. We need to take care of that. Uh, to be able to worship Him truly in spirit and in truth. So uh, tonight, to keep that in mind tonight as we worship Him. And we have, like I said, let's be a prayer for Brother Vito as he comes up and he, he leads us uh, tonight in, in the Word. And but guys, if you want to come on down, we'll take up our evening offering and we'll go ahead and get started with our service. Again, thank you so much for being here this evening. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Lord, we come to you right now. Just asking for your Holy Spirit to come on this place. Lord, to move us out of the way. For us to worship and sing to an audience of one, Lord, and that's you. Lord, we come and pray if there's someone here today that's dealing with something, Lord, they can take it and bring it at your feet tonight. Lord, as we talk this morning, Lord, if there's sin in the way, Lord, I pray we take care of it right now. Because, Lord, that stunts our growth as Christians. And that sin between us. Lord, be with us tonight. I pray your Holy Spirit will move freely among us worship your name. I love you and thank you. Never pray. Amen. And stay with the choir this evening. We'll start off tonight by singing 10,000 Reasons. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Bless the Lord, oh my soul.
sing this chorus together. We sing it a lot here. I love you, Lord. Let's get our hearts and our minds ready for tonight to hear his word. fellowship lord thank you again for tonight lord we love you lord lord let it not just be words that we say when we come in here let it not be mechanical every time we come in here but lord make it anew every time we thank you lord for what you did on, on calvary lord let us not forget each and every day lord make us new let us never forget the wonder of the cross Again, be with us tonight. And Brother Vitito, give him the words to say. And I pray. Amen. As the choir comes down, let's have a time of fellowship. Thank you.
Good evening. It's good to see everyone tonight. We have a good crowd here. We've had wonderful singing and uh, had an awesome service this morning. And uh, I'm glad you just keep going to God's well and it doesn't, uh, it didn't deplete you because you had a good, good service today. You can have one tonight. And uh, I, uh, I, I was challenged by a couple of folks as we left this morning, and one, one said, uh, you didn't hit me because I don't like McDonald's. And uh, another said, you, don't, uh, you didn't hit me because I don't like McDonald's either. But I found out what they do like, and I've changed my message. That's what I'm going to preach on tonight. <laughs> Hardee's and Burger King. So I'll get the rest of you uh, tonight at the message. I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be back. I had a sweet time this morning, good liberty to preach, wonderful reception, sweet, friendly people, and uh, I love Brother Mike and Sister Debbie, and I'm just uh, glad to be a part of this revival. I feel so honored to have this uh, great privilege, and then I look back and I'm refreshed when I see some Dear friends of mine here visiting tonight that uh, were with me 50 years ago when I started as a 24-year-old boy uh, at, uh, uh, at Ballard, Old Ballard's Chapel Baptist Church here in Blount County. And uh, they, uh, they were with me. They weren't married then. Uh, but uh, in fact, I kept trying to keep them apart back in those days. But... <laughs> Glad to have Jerry Marlene uh, with us. And, uh, I'm like the little boy uh, with all this great singing and uh, sweet fellowship. I'm like a little boy that fell in a vat of molasses, and he began to pray. He said, Dear Lord, please give me a tongue equal to the opportunity. <laughs> I feel like that little boy tonight, and so I'm, I'm praying for a tongue that's equal to this a uh, great opportunity God has presented. I want to invite you to turn with me to Romans chapter 1, if you will, uh, please. And uh, we're going to talk about evangelism and about witnessing and being the witness that God wants us to be. I noticed uh, that some of the songs uh, talked about that. Uh, l let me be a witness through the night. You lead me, Lord, and I'll follow and uh, you show me uh, what I need to do. And, and so some of the songs go a lot along with what God has impressed me uh, tonight to speak about. And I want to talk to us on the subject, the motivation for evangelism. Uh, you could say the motivation to be a witness. Uh, it, it would be the, have the same meaning. But I want to begin reading in the 14th verse of Romans chapter 1, and I would like you to pay special attention to three I am statements that Paul makes in this passage. Beginning at verse 14, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. I uh, believe that in our day, our present day church time that witnessing has become somewhat of a back burner issue for many professing Christians. And yet Jesus would declare that being a witness is the primary function of a New Testament church. 
He tells us in Acts 1, you, uh, when you are endued with power, you shall be my witnesses. And then he goes on to say that you'll be my witness in Jerusalem. And uh, by, by the way, let me just pause here. Uh, he said, you'll be my witness in Jerusalem. I would like to have been a fly on the wall when he told the disciples that. Lord, surely you don't mean we're the witness in Jerusalem. They condemned you to die. They despise you. Why would we go back to Jerusalem to be a witness? And yet our Lord said, start at Jerusalem. Then Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. In Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, we read our Lord's mission statement. He said, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. And then finally, Matthew 28, and when he talks about the great commission, that we're to go you therefore into all the world. Uh, some Baptists think that the great commission is what a real estate agent gets when they sell a big house. But uh, it isn't. It's really a commission to God's people to be on the move, to be militant, if you will, in the fact we're, we're to be proactive. We're not to sit and, and wait to see what comes to us and what happens. We're to go, therefore, into all the world. So as we think about these things, I'm confident that most of us, I, I think you're like I am. I always believe that I should be doing better. I should be a better witness. That's just ingrained into me. I feel like I fail uh, quite often. And we know, most of us, if we were to make a confession, that we ought to get more involved in witnessing for our Lord. But what will it take to motivate us to do that? What would it take to motivate God's church to get, get busy doing what he has asked us to do? And I think we'll discover that motivation from the heart of the Apostle Paul as we examine these three I am statements that we've read uh, tonight. The first one is simply this. I want us to look back at verse 14 and understand that we will be motivated to be a witness when we feel personally responsible. Listen to what Paul said. I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. I owe a debt. Paul would describe himself as a chief sinner, but we know what happened to him. The high sheriff of the universe arrested him on the road to Damascus one day, and his life was never the same. And Paul felt like he owed it to people to tell them what happened to him. He owed it uh, to the Greeks, to the Gentiles, to the barbarians, the wise, and the unwise. I believe I owe it to others to tell them who God is and what he'll do for you. There's a, there's a plaque hanging somewhere in an obscure corner of the Alamo. And that plaque is unusual because it, uh, it, it's about a man that died in the battle with Santa Ana, the Battle of the Alamo in, in Texas. And uh, his name was Colonel James Bohannon. And so that plaque is an unusual plaque it's got a picture of a man, of a soldier on that plaque. And it said, uh, this picture is not 
the great American hero, Colonel James Bohannon, but rather it is his nephew who looks a great deal like Colonel Bohannon. They closely resemble each other, and the family wanted you to see what a great American hero looked like. You think about that for a moment. You think about that picture, the nephew who greatly resembles his uncle. Who are we supposed to resemble? To the community, to the world, to the area that we live in, who is it that we are supposed to represent? You see, you and I are the only Bible a lot of folks will read. We're the only way they have of identifying who Jesus is and what kind of person that Jesus really is. You and I are to resemble our Lord. This message kind of, I didn't mean for it to, but it tags on to what we were talking about this morning. Sometimes we don't resemble him very well, do we? We, we don't identify him to a lost man, woman, boy or girl in the, in the best manner or the best state. I uh, I heard a pastor who pastors in northern Georgia t- telling the story about a group of preachers. They were out uh, for a little preacher's get-together. It was in the mid-morning. They went to a restaurant to drink coffee and eat dessert and just talk with each other. There was about six or seven of them around a big round table, and their waitress was not a very good one. She did not pay close attention to the needs that, that they had. She wouldn't fill their coffee up. She was slow taking their order. She was slow bringing their order. And then she got the orders all mixed up. It seems like she was distracted for some reason. And while she was trying to serve these preachers at that table, she'd be talking to another server somewhere over here, just not paying attention to details. So they were almost finished with their get-together that morning. And this server brought a fresh, hot, cup of coffee to to give to one of the preachers and as she started to hand it down she turned to talk to say a word to somebody else and spill that hot cup of coffee all down the front of that pastor he was wearing a new suit that day by the way she didn't know it at the time but she just felt like man I'm in trouble now I am in trouble now. I'll be reported. I may be fired. At the very least, I'll have to pay the cleaning bill. I'm in trouble. The pastors all got through with their coffee and their dessert, and they left. That waitress went back to the table where the man sat that she had spilled the coffee on, And he had left for her his business card and the largest tip she had ever received in all the time she had been serving. The largest tip she had ever gotten. She took that business card, looked at the church where he pastored and saw the address. And two weeks later from that Day she came on a Sunday morning and sat in the service. And when the invitation was given, she came and accepted Jesus. 
Here was a man who was representing what Christ might do to those who mistreated him. He was a good picture of what a Christian ought to be, what a Christian should be. I'm not sure I always represent Christ the way I should. I'm not sure I'm always the best picture of what Jesus would be if he were here in person. The second I am is found in verse 15. I believe we'll be motivated to be a witness not only when we feel personally responsible, but secondly, when we become passionate about the gospel. Look at what Paul would say in verse 15. So, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. How are you going to do it, Paul? With as much as in me is. We, uh, we sometimes aren't as passionate as we ought to be when it comes to being a, a witness. This word ready, Paul would say, I am ready. That word ready is the same uh, Greek word from where we get the, the word thermometer. And Paul uh, is saying, uh, in essence, I'm heated up about the gospel. I'm heated up about telling people what Jesus can do for them. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Sometimes I lose the passion, the excitement of who I am in him. The truth is, you know, not many Baptists are heated up about anything. They're just not. I heard about a guy who went to work one Monday morning, and a fellow came in who was a deacon in his church, and uh, he was just going on and on. He said, man, did we have a great service yesterday. I believe revivals broke out at our church. We had a tremendous service, and somebody said, what happened? He said, one of our deacons said amen. <laughs> We're almost to that in some churches. I mean, I've pastored where I wish a baby would cry. Anything to, anything to stir us up just a little bit. Paul was heated up about the reality of hell, the wonder of heaven. He knew that this modernistic world that, that we live in, want to, they want to preach a Bible that everybody understands. They want a cross with no blood. They want a, a hell with no heat. They want a heaven with no sweetness. They want a judgment with no right or wrong. But I've got news for those birds. All of those are true. Hell is hot and heaven is sweet. You know Jesus, you can go to heaven. If you fail to receive Jesus, you die and go to hell. We ought to get passionate and heated up about what the gospel consists of. I like the story that Don McKenzie told. He was a pastor. He went to the hospital one night. This was a few years ago when the, you remember, they used to do it at Blunt Memorial. Both of my daughters were b born at Blunt Memorial. Memorial, And I, I, I not only pastored in this area, but I spent some time up there visiting other people. There was a time the lights would be turned in. About 8.30 or something, visiting hours would be over, and they would dim the lights. And then everybody 
You know, she'd go home. Visiting hours were no longer. But Don McKenzie got to the hospital rather late, and he was walking down the dark hallway to make a visit. When all of a sudden, some fellow rushed out of his room and rushed up to Don McKenzie and got his lapel and shook him real good and said, Mr., she's going to make it. She's going to make it. Mr., she is going to make it. Don McKenzie said, "Uh, who? Who's going to make it? Oh, he said, my wife. She's finally turned the corner. Her fever's broken. And uh, the doctor said she's going to be all right. She's going to make it, mister. You see, here was a man that had a message he was passionate about. He didn't care who he told it to. Didn't matter. He just had a story of good news. His beloved wife was going to make it. He wanted somebody to hear that. Shouldn't we get passionate about heaven and hell? Shouldn't we get passionate about eternal security and being born again? Shouldn't we get passionate about the the, the inerrant, infallible uh, word of Almighty God? Shouldn't we get passionate about our testimony, about being witnesses for the Lord? I like the trick that Jesus played on the social snobs of Gadara. You, you remember the guy that dwelled in the tombs that they couldn't tame, they couldn't do anything with, and when he met Jesus, he was clothed and in his right mind sitting at the feet of Jesus. Well, it came time for Jesus to leave that country. In fact, they asked him to leave. And this man who used to dwell in the tombs, who was now in his right mind and clothed, he wanted to go with Jesus. And I just thought for sure our Lord would allow him to tag along. Man, he could be a good witness, in, you know, in, in, when they have a, a preaching service. He could give a good testimony about what God had done for him. But Jesus said, no, I don't want you to follow me. I want you to go back to your home and tell those people uh, what great things the Lord has done for you. And so Jesus sent him, the Bible says, to the capitalist. That just simply means ten cities. Ten cities. And Jesus sent a on fire, spirit-filled, passionate, wild man from the tombs that God had redeemed by his precious blood and he's on his way to heaven. Send him back to those social snobs so he could tell this story. You want God sent us to the communities we live in. God sent us to the place where we work. God sent you and I to the schools that we attend. God has a work for us to do. On fire and passionate. We live in a world where there's no lack of passion. There's plenty of passion in America. There's, there's folks passionate about the NFL, the NBA. There's... Uh, there's uh, Uh, the PGA, there's people passionate about uh, a million things. They're passionate about the politics. They're passionate about uh, everything you want to talk about. But there's very few passionate about the right things. Heard about a man in Chicago uh, who who had bought him a new straw hat, and he was so proud of that straw hat. He was walking home down the side of a Busy thoroughfare, eight lanes of traffic. And you know how the windy city, the wind's always blowing in that area. And a gust of wind came and took his hat, blew it off his head, and right out into the middle of traffic. And so he chased after it. 
He went through the first lane. He went through the second lane. He went through all the lanes until he got to the last lane, and he finally had his hat. Uh, he finally was ready to get his hat. He, all he had to do was reach down and pick it up. So he reached down, got a hold of that straw hat, and just as he did, a semi-truck ran right over the top of him. He was passionate, but he was passionate about the wrong things. If the Jehovah's Witness could get passionate about their doctrine... The Mormons can get passionate about their doctrine. The Muslims can get passionate about their prayer clause and their doctrine. Why can't we get passionate about the truth that can set people free and give them hope and eternal life? Amen. William Fay, Dr. William Fay talks about in his sermons, I've heard him speak and he talks about the sin of silence there's a sin of silence when we're told to speak and we're told to go and we're told to tell and yet we just remain silent i think we have some accountability issues when we are silent and god wants us to speak up. The last thing we find is in verse 16. Not only will we be motivated to be a witness when we get passionate, we will also be motivated to be a witness when we become proud of the gospel. Notice what Paul would say in verse 16. For I am not ashamed the very opposite of that is, I'm proud of it. I'm not ashamed of it, I'm proud of it. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. I'm glad it said to everyone that believeth, aren't you? That meant me, that meant you. Everyone. It won't, it'll change your life. There's three reasons that I think Paul was proud of the gospel. One, he's proud of it because it stands supreme. Do you know that God only has a plan A for people getting saved and getting to heaven? He doesn't have a plan B or C, just one plan. And Jesus gave that to us in John 14 and 6. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me didn't say there's a it's a good way it's one of many ways he said it's the only way it's the only way paul was proud because the gospel stands alone there's no substitute for it secondly he's proud of it because it is sufficient he, he's proud of what it did for him He's, he's proud of what it did for others that he witnessed to and those churches he helped establish and those souls who were saved. He was proud of what it did. I'm proud of what the gospel did for my family. It was the gospel that convicted my dad in Morgan County uh, in the early part of last century. And he gave his heart to Jesus. And guess what? He influenced me. He influenced me to want to do it. To give my heart to Christ. I never will when I forget when I got that first talk. We were alone. Daddy said, I don't know how to say this, son, but someday I want you to get saved. I want you to know Jesus. Here's what happened to me. I want it to happen to you. I'm proud of the gospel because of what it did for my daughters. Both of our little girls were saved on the same Mother's Day at Reed Springs Baptist Church in Philadelphia, Tennessee. I was pastoring there. 
One of them was saved in the morning service. The other was saved in the evening service. I'll tell you, I am proud of the gospel. I am proud of the gospel. I'm proud of it because I got to see my grandson accept Jesus Christ and my granddaughter accept Jesus Christ, and I got to baptize both of them. I'm proud of what the gospel does, the effect that it has on people. The third reason he was proud of it because it's simple. It's not complex. It's simple. I'm going to share a story with you. Now I'm going to close in just a few moments. I'm going to share a story with you. It's probably one of the most impactful, simple little stories I've ever, ever told. It really has touched my heart. It's so simple. Two boys were fighting on the playground at school. And a kid ran in to the teacher and said, Teacher, come quickly. There's two boys out on the playground fighting. And the one on the bottom would sure like to see you. I like that story because of its impact and its meaning, but I also like the fact I've been the one on the bottom. So have you. Who's the one on the bottom? In the spiritual context, it's that person who has never accepted Jesus as their personal Savior. When their heart stops beating, they could be in hell. No hope. No reprieve. No pardon. That's the one that's on the bottom tonight. And somewhere around where you work and where you attend school and where you live and where you vacation, there's somebody on the bottom. There's somebody on the bottom that needs to hear from you. My passion for being a witness was stirred greatly many, many years ago. I was just a, a kid preacher, just started. I was visiting with my dad and Steve. I believe it was Steve and maybe my other brother, Lynn. We went to see my aunt at the old UT hospital. My dad had claustrophobia and he wouldn't go on the elevator, so we had to walk up nine floors of steps. That was a blessing now. And we had to walk up those steps, and we went up and visited my aunt, and it was time to leave, and we started down the stairwell. And as we went out on the dark stairwell to start down, there was a lady sitting. This was a Saturday night. She was sitting on the top step of that stairwell with a Bible in her lap. And I first thought, Boy, that's sweet. She's, got a, she's a Sunday school teacher. She's studying for her Sunday school lesson tomorrow. How wonderful is that? So we, we, we just got on by. We kind of, she scooted a little, and we turned sideways and got by her and went on down. But after we got down a couple of floors, a couple of flights, I felt so impressed to say a word to that lady. And I asked the rest of the family, just to wait on me a moment. And I went back up there, and I said, Ma'am, I was so touched to see you uh, reading your Bible on a Saturday night. Are you studying your Sunday school lesson? And she said, No. Oh, I said, I'm sorry. I, I just guessing. She said, uh, I'm trying to find out if anybody loves me. I'm trying to find out if anybody loves me. And on that dark stairwell that night, her name was Glenda. I had the opportunity to 
point to her John 3.16. Point to her another passage or two. And say, Glenda, would you like to accept Jesus as your personal Savior? I was a kid. I didn't know how to. I never had any training. I didn't know how to witness. I didn't know what to say. But that night she bowed. Never seen her since. I've never laid eyes on her, don't know where she's from, don't know what community she lives in, but I know one thing, I believe I'll see her again. I believe I'll see her again. Somebody's on the bottom. You were on the bottom one day and somebody came to you. Now someone else is on the bottom and they're waiting for you to come. Let's get a song ready, Brother Trey, if you will, please. Play softly, but fudge when you get it with your song. I wonder, I wonder as somebody waits for you, if they'll wait in vain, are you going to show up? Am I going to show up? I know this doesn't sound plausible, but I'm very backward. I'm a very shy individual. I've always, I have been most of my life. I know you can't listen to my loud voice and believe that tonight, but I, I assure you, I know what it is to be shy and want to stay in the edge of the crowd. But somebody needs to hear you from you. Somebody is on the bottom. We don't know how near they may be. To eternity without hope they are really on the bottom I wonder if you'd be willing to make a stab at it I wonder if you'd be willing to try I wonder if you could conjure up just enough passion to make you get out of your box get out of your comfort zone say something to somebody I wonder I wonder as we give the invitation tonight in this time of invitation you're saved you're here you're on your way to heaven I wonder if you're proud of the gospel convicted in your heart I wonder if you're proud. I wonder if you're passionate about what Christianity is all about. I wonder if you're ashamed of the story that brought tears to your eyes and caused you to turn one day, sometime in your life, to give your heart to Christ. There's somebody else that needs to hear that story. And we're living in an era they're not, they're not all coming to church. I wish they would all come to church this, during this revival, but they won't. Most of them that are on the bottom won't show up. You have to find them. You have to tell them. You have to mimic Jesus. You have to love like Jesus loved and speak like Jesus spoke and forgive like Jesus forgives. Mike and I were talking earlier. The bad thing is not that we lose our temper as Christians. The bad thing is when we don't make it right. When we don't make it right. I wonder if there are those here tonight that would say, I want to try. I want to be a better witness. I, I want to do more than I've done in the past. You know, most people, I think, through the church that are saved are people that are invited in by, by members of the church. Not what, it's not who the pastor goes after. It's not who we go out to get and bring in who you work with it's who you go to school with it's 
they come to my church. There's wonderful things happening there. There's lives being forever changed at our church. Come to my church. You'll hear the gospel. Would you be willing to do something? Would you be willing to do more than you've ever done before? I may be speaking tonight to somebody who's on the bottom. There could be somebody in this room tonight who deep in your heart, you know you're not ready to go to heaven. You're not ready to meet God. You do not have the gift of eternal life. You're on the bottom. I tell you, we're here to tell you the good news that Jesus cares about you. Jesus died for you. You could come tonight and give your heart to Christ. Without Him. Oh, what a beautiful song. We're going to sing the invitation to Him. And I'm going to invite folks just to slip out from where you are. This is revival. If we do the same old thing we've always done, and expect different results, it's the very height of insanity. We want different things to happen. We have to do some different things. I'm not talking about changing the way we worship. I'm not talking about changing Bibles. I'm not talking about that. But if we've been silent for a long time, Maybe there's somebody that you could influence that nobody in this world could influence. Would you be willing to try? You have lost loved ones. What about children and grandchildren? What about grandchildren who haven't yet come to the age of accountability? It's not too early. I started praying for mine while they were in the, in the womb to be saved. I wonder if the Holy Spirit would just stir a passion in one heart in this building. One heart. I talked to a pastor the other day that it's near me. He and I have been about the, we were at the churches. We were in neighboring churches. And after all these years, his church kind of started mushrooming and growing and he's baptizing a lot of folks and I asked him, I said, Brother Gary, can you tell me what the secret is? What's the, caused the turnaround? Can you pinpoint it? And he said, Jerry, I can pinpoint it to the day a 40-year-old diesel mechanic came to our church and got saved. We baptized him. He said that's been almost two years ago, and he's not stopped bringing people in. He's brought people he works with in and they've gotten saved and baptized. He's brought family in. He said it all started with one 40 year old diesel mechanic. Said he's more, he, 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 Gary said he's more of a redneck than I am. He do not know a lot of scripture. He's not been in church much, but he's excited about what God did for him. We've forgotten what it's like to be a new Christian sometimes. Would you tell it? Would you share? Would you work? Would you tr just try? Would you just try? As we give, give this time of invitation, I want you just to find a place on the altar. I want you just to slip out from where you are. As we get into this revival, it's not too late to see things happen in these nights together folks would get passionate and get excited i invite you to come i invite you lost person to come and be saved we'll be glad to pray with you talk with you while we stand and while we begin to see we need to just find a place on the altar and say i want to be used i want to be used of god I know lost people that I love and I care about and I want to see them come to know Christ. Without Him I could do nothing. Oh yeah. You like to come? Without Him you like to come? I truly feel
live without a self. Like a sin. Be a copy of God's see all these bowing on the altar somebody on the bottom in Blunt County has a little more hope because someone is going to say something and reach out to them and be the witness that they feel like they ought to be I wonder if you're you feel like you're on the bottom you don't know where to turn you don't know which way to go would you bring would you bring your battle Jesus, would you make peace with him? Would you come tonight to be saved? And while we continue to sing, you just come. We'll pray with you. Without we'll pray with you. him, I would be dying. Oh, yes. You're welcome. Without him, I'd be enslaved. Thank God I chapter 4 that the Bible says that Jesus had a need to go to the city of Samaria and the reason he had a need to go to Samaria there was a little woman by the well drawing out water and she needed to see Jesus and I was thinking about that tonight who must you need to go see Tomorrow, Who must you need to call tonight? I've said before, when you get serious about being a witness for the Lord, he'll put the people in your path. So you pray about that tonight. Lord, who must I call tomorrow? Who must I go see tomorrow? Who must I invite to come to God's house tomorrow? You pray that and see what happens. He'll use you. I'm sitting on the bench. Two names came to my mind. I'm going tomorrow. If I have to crawl, I'm going. They both need Jesus. Who must you needs to go see and call? Wonderful sermon tonight. Amen. 
don't forget at the back, our ushers will are taking up a love offering for Brother Jerry at the end of every service. And I appreciate you giving, and you give as God has blessed. Tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, come back. It'll just continue to get better. Say amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening in God's house. I thank you for the wonderful word that we've heard from the word of God. I thank you for the man that delivered it. And I thank you for touching my soul. And not only did it touch my heart, but I believe it touched every heart in the auditorium this evening. Now, Father, as we leave those doors, you put it upon our heart. Who must we go see? Who must we call tonight or tomorrow? And may we be faithful in doing so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you and thank you so much for coming.